chapter today, Isaiah 46. Not, not really a very long one, but uh, we're going to do it because it really goes together well, and I think, it should be, uh, I think it should be studied as one unit. Isaiah chapter 46. And we'll get to that in a minute. I wanted to start with some opening comments to try to get us thinking about what's going to be in this text. And this is what I came up with. Uh, I came up with the fact that in this life, there's a lot of things that just don't make sense. There's some things that don't make sense at all. There's a lot of things that don't make sense. For instance, the son of David named Solomon, who was the king of Israel at one time, said this, and he recorded it in a biblical book called Ecclesiastes in chapter 10 and verse 7. And I quote, Solomon said, I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the ground. Now, if you're the king of Israel, especially a, a very powerful and rich king like Solomon, that would be something that would get your attention. To see that there is a slave riding on a camel or a horse, and the king is on the ground maybe leading that animal along. He says, that just doesn't make sense. In fact, in the context, particular, uh, in the context of that particular passage, he says, I have seen evil in the world, and then he mentions that one thing. It's just out of place. It doesn't make sense. Well, that's odd, isn't it, if you saw something like that? God said that people will set a trap for themselves in that very same passage in Ecclesiastes, and they will end up in the trap, uh, I'm set a trap for others, but they will end up in that trap themselves. That wouldn't make sense. Some people badmouth a judge today, and then they get a night in jail to think about the kind of uh, words that they said in the court and how they were contemptuous, and they get out, and the judge gives them another chance the next day to act like they're supposed to act, and they do it again, and they go back to jail again until they can learn their lesson. Some people have invented things and later were killed by the very thing that they invented. just doesn't make sense. There are people who have invested their life savings in circuit, certain market opportunities, only at the end of their lives to lose it all and to die in extreme poverty. Some things just don't make sense. They don't make any sense. I wonder, would you go out and buy a new car and then go out to your friends and hire them so that they would push you around in your new car once you owned it? And the answer is no. You don't want your car to be pushed by people. You want it to run on its own power. That would be ridiculous. Or would you go out and buy a new horse and then, uh, then go out and every day you carry that horse around to different places in the pasture and carry it once a day over to the water tank uh, so, so it could get a drink of water? No, that'd be ridiculous. Would you purchase an airline ticket to Hawaii and then take a boat? Probably not. Would you pay a craftsman big bucks to carve you a god out of wood and overlay it with gold and then invite all your friends to come over on Saturday and bow down and worship it with you, and we'll have a potluck after that's all over. Well, I hope you think that's ridiculous as well, that we wouldn't do that. It doesn't make sense. It would defy common sense. Really, how far would you go uh, in, in getting a, a nice, cute block of wood and bowing down and praying to it and overlaying it with gold and realizing one day that the gold on your idol is worth more than the idol itself? We see things in life that don't make sense at all. And to God and Isaiah, today he's going to talk about the fact that idols don't make any sense. They're good for no one. All right, now before I go, do I have a problem here? Do you want me to switch to this? Because I'm fading in and out. No? You're going to try me? Okay. All right. Well, whatever's going on there, bear with us. Uh, if it goes out, I'll, I'll just talk louder. All right. Let's read our text, shall we? Uh, Isaiah chapter 46. And here's what it says. By the way, it's going to begin with two Babylonian gods, Bel, his other name is Marduk, and his son, which is Nebo. These are obviously idols of Babylon, and uh, we don't believe that they are really gods. We don't believe that they are, are real at all. And here's what it says in verse 1 of chapter 46. Bel has bowed down, Nebo stoops over. Their images are consigned to the beasts and the cattle. The things that you carry are burdensome, a load for the weary beast. They stooped over, and they have bowed down together. They could not rescue the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. You have been born by me from birth, and have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it, 
and I will carry you, and I will bear you, and I will deliver you. Now, what you're supposed to pick up on so far is there are, there are these false gods that people carry around, and then we run into this god, his Hebrew name is Yahweh, and he says, no, I'm the one that does the carrying, not you. And, and it shouldn't be that you carry your gods, it should be your god carries you. Then he goes on to say in verse 5, To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we would be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scale hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god. They bow down to it, indeed they worship it. They lift it up upon their shoulders and carry it. They set it in its place and it stands there. It does not move from its place, though one may cry to it. It cannot answer, it cannot deliver from his distress. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to your heart, your transgressions. Remember the former things of long ago, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, a man of my purpose, from a far country, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass, I have planned it, I will surely do it. Listen to me, you stubborn-hearted, who are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness, it is not far off, and my salvation will not delay, and I will grant salvation in Zion, my glory for Israel. Now, I want to point out some things that the prophet has done so that we don't miss them as we look at the signposts in the text. Verse 3, he says, listen to me. Verse 8, he says, remember this. He also says, recall it to mind. Verse 9, remember the former things. And then he ends in verse 12, listen to me. Now the problem is, and and you need to recognize this because uh, it's important for us, who was Isaiah written to? Isaiah was written to the people of God, the people that he chose, that he brought out of Egypt, that he gave them their temple. He He said, I'm your God, I'll be with you, you worship me. These are religious people. These are people who know Yahweh. These are people who have seen his mighty acts and they, and they watch how he has worked through history and what he's doing with them. It is to these people that he says, listen to me, remember, recall, remember, and listen to me what I'm trying to tell you that your, your idols are worthless. Why would you have to tell religious people that belong to Jesus, religious people that belong to Yahweh, you need to put away your idols? What are we doing with idols anyway? We're not supposed to have them. And we live in a day and an age, we live in a country where we don't normally have little idols around, you know, in our houses or, or at church. You'll, you'll notice, you can look around all over here, and we've never once set up an idol anywhere in this sanctuary. We never would. We don't put up icons in the sanctuary. We want people to understand who God is, and he's not this idol. He's not this statue over here, and we don't pray to statues. We don't pray to idols. We pray to the living God. And, and, and we don't see idols a lot, but we have idols. And we have things that get in the way of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So this is very much for us in our day. And we need to listen to what the Lord has to say. Because religious people can and will turn away from God and not do what is right. In verses 1 to 4, what we learn is this. People have to carry false gods, but our God carries us. People will have to carry a false god, but our god belongs to us. Can you imagine being over at somebody's house and they say, oh, by the way, we found a new god that we're worshiping, and they they say, let me get him for you, and they go get their god, they bring it out, and they set it up on a chair, this is the closest chair I have. They set it up there, and say, whoop, whoop, almost fell, we got to hold him there. So you hold him by the head and say, here's our god that we worship, isn't he wonderful, isn't he beautiful? And, And this is the ridiculousness that God is talking about through Isaiah today. Uh, It should get our attention if you have to carry your God around and and help him do stuff. Isaiah has been relentless in the mockery and and dissension toward idols because he knows their faults and he knows it's going to lead people away from the true God. An idol is an image, it's an idea, it's an object that people set up in worship as if it were the real God with God-like powers thinking that that little God, that little idol can influence matters on earth. Now, you maybe have never bowed down to an idol. I hope you haven't. But maybe you're bowing down to money. Maybe you're bowing down to some sports idol that you have or some political leader that you have. 
Maybe you're worshiping somebody in a godlike manner that isn't God, and you're trusting in them to fix all of your problems. And I've just been on the earth long enough to realize, I've been through enough elections to know that, that, that it's useless for me to depend on political leaders to solve all my problems and to make my life secure. It's not going to happen. I don't care what they are, what brand they are, I can't trust in them, and neither can you. Anything that a person honors or worships as if it were God in a, or in a way that only God should be worshipped, honored and loved, can be an idol. Even money and even people. People have always put faith in things like, uh, like things that we make or from creation that they can control and they can manipulate and then they expect these idols to change their life in a way that affects eternity and it's just not going to happen. I might have a bigger idol who doesn't need to sit on a chair and maybe he's made out of solid gold or whatever it might be. It could be a female deity, whatever it is. I, I still have nothing. I still just have a pile of gold there that I might as well sell and use for another purpose because I can pray all day and I'm not going to get anything of value at all from that idol. Nothing can happen that's going to help me there. The Lord predicted the downfall of the greatest of, of the nations of the day, and that is Babylon. And he predicted the downfall by talking about their gods. The first one he mentions in verse 1 is Bel. Another name for him is Marduk. And we know that there were people that sacrificed children to him and, and to Molech and others. And then he had a son, a sun god, and his name was Nebo. And both of them are mentioned by the prophet in verse 1. Bel has bowed down, Nebo stoops over. Not the position you would expect of an idol. Not that you would expect that even of a god of any kind. Why is he bowed down? Why is he bent low? What's going on here, we're supposed to ask? Because a, an idol would bow to no one. An idol would not be stooped over. But something has happened here. The only time an idol would fall is if that idol has been defeated by some other god. Marduk, or Bel, appears in the Babylonian creation epic called the Enuma Elish. And in that, he is painted as a hero. He is credited with giving a place to other gods in the universe and setting the stars in their place. And it would seem, according to Enuma Elish, that he created man to worship and serve the gods. Notice the twist again. God created us that we might worship with him, but also have worship him, but also have fellowship with him as his friends, as his brothers and his sisters. That's what our God has in mind for us, a relationship. But that's not what Marduk did. That's not what Bel did. He created people so that they would spend their life serving the gods and waiting on them. They don't care about the people. The people need to care about the gods. There's a big difference these Babylonian gods will soon be brought low. They will bow down. They will stoop over by the true God, by Yahweh. In verse 1, there were times the Babylonians paraded during their New Year's celebration, their gods, and they, they would uh, take them out of their temples and they would parade them through the New Year's Day parade and they were very heavy. Now you can imagine that if I'm just an average Babylonian and I have copy of the idol uh, of Marduk or of Nebo. It's probably going to be pretty small so I can keep it in my house somewhere. But down at their temple, it's a whole different story. These things can be massive. They can be huge. And, and when they go to parade them through the streets so everybody could worship, they would actually have to take some animals and some big carts and put them on there so they could get these massive idols down the street. And then we understand then what, what he's saying. He says, the images are consigned to the beasts and to the cattle. In other words, carried or, or mounted, by, uh, mounted some way uh, by the animal's strength. The things that you carry are burdensome. They are a load and, and they weary the beasts. They are stooped over and they have bowed down together. And the reason they have is because it found, they found out they could not rescue their own people. They had no power and so they are defeated. It was a burden and a real chore to have to move them around. Nobody, none of us ever thinks about when we take a trip that somehow we've got to get Jesus to go with us and we've got to come down to the church here and pick him up and put him in our car and, and carry him around everywhere we go so we can be safe. How ridiculous would that be? What kind of a God needs you to carry him around? And they are defeated because Yahweh is going to defeat them and those who worship them are without hope in a time of distress. Neither Bel nor Nebo could rescue the people from the disaster that Yahweh was bringing upon the city and the nation of Babylon. What good is a God who can't save you? What good is a God who can't save your soul? 
They themselves have also been taken captive by the one who conquers their people. And by the way, this is a prediction about what's going to happen to Babylon still yet in the future. Shouldn't someone have stopped along the way and said, Hey, Martha, uh, what kind of a God has to be hauled around by us humans because they can't move by themselves? Shouldn't that get your attention? Shouldn't you wonder about that? Why is it that every time this God goes somewhere, we're the ones that take him? How come this God doesn't speak to us? How come he doesn't do anything? One day, however, there will be an impressive idol like none ever in the past, and I want to draw your attention to that in Revelation 13. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want to lead you astray and say that idols don't have power. They really don't. It's just the demonic forces behind the idols that do have power and, and are, the, are the forces behind the idol accepting the worship. Those do have power, but an idol is nothing. But there is an idol coming someday that is going to be able to do some great things on this earth uh, for a bad cause. I want to look down at verse uh, 14. Now, here's the story. The Antichrist has a prophet, and he's called the false prophet, and the false prophet decides we need to worship the Antichrist, so he builds an idol. And somehow, through satanic power, he is given the power to give that idol life, and the idol comes to life. And I want to pick it up in uh, verse 13 with, uh, with the uh, false prophet. It says, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. He's pretending to be God. Verse 14, then he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which is, which is given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, that's the Antichrist, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image, here's that idol, make an image, so it's an idol, to the beast who had the wound of the sword and who's come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And then the rest of the chapter talks about what this image is allowed to do. So for the first time in all of history, somebody's going to build an image, an idol, in the form of the Antichrist, and the false prophet, through the power of Satan, is going to give this lifeless image the power to come alive, and this image is going to cause people to worship the beast, to get the 666 number on their forehead so they can buy and sell, and he's also going to cause people who don't follow the beast to be put to death. And that's the only one in all of history that's going to actually be alive, and what it's going to do is work hard to lead people away from Jesus to their destruction eternally. So you wouldn't want to follow him. In verses 3 and 4, Yahweh cries out, Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. And then he asks this question, You who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb, even to your old age I will be the same, and even to your graying years I will bear you. I have done it, meaning in the past, and I will carry you in the future and I will bear you, and I will deliver you. What a great contrast from these idols that he's been talking about in Isaiah. They're lifeless, they are dead. If you want them to move, you have to carry them, you can pray to them, and you're not going to get anything of benefit. But the Lord says, if you come to me, the one who's been carrying you from the time of the, that you were in the womb to your graying years, I have done it and I will do it, then you will find something of value and something that you should have. God doesn't need to be carried. God carries you. As opposed to the lifeless and useless idols of the pagans, our God is the only God who carries his people from the womb to the grave. We never outgrow our need for God, and God never stops taking care of us. And, and as I uh, every day face more and more old age, I'm so glad that I have a God who is powerful and strong, and I can count on him to carry me and to take care of me and to strengthen me when I have none. You know, when I was younger, I thought I could take care of myself. I didn't realize I really couldn't. I didn't realize that it was my strength that I could do all these things by. It was God's strength anyway. But in your old age, you finally realize, I have no strength. I never did, and God promises to love me and carry me. We never outgrow our need for God, and God will never outgrow his need to take care of us because he loves us. He carries us. He bears us up. He delivers his people, those who trust in him. I hope you're one who trusts in him. Isn't the choice clear? You can carry 
you can rinse with mild soap and water, you can dust your little God, or you can serve a real God who carries you and takes care of you. History proves that this is what he is like, and he will continue to be like this. In verses 5 to 7, we learn, why would anyone even try to compare Yahweh to a worthless idol? There is no comparison. There is no one in the universe in verse 5, human, material, or spiritual, who is like God or who could ever be compared to him. This is God's claim to the exclusivity of who he is as God. Today is still the same. There are no other gods, not anywhere. That's why in our worldview we are theists. We are not into polytheism. Many gods, we're not into panentheism, which means God in anything. We're not into pantheism, that God is everywhere, or animism, or finite godism, or atheism, or deism, all of which are false teachings. There is only one God, not multitudes of gods. There is a God, and his name is Yahweh. There is no other. That's why we hold the theism that there is a God. He is outside of creation. He controls it. He made it. He's more powerful than creation, and he can save you. Those who believe in finite godism or deism or polytheism or pantheism or panentheism or atheism have no god that can do anything like that. Verses 6 and 7. Idols are labor-intensive without return, profit, or benefit. Look what he says. Those who have lavished gold from their purse, they weigh out silver on the scale, they hire the goldsmith, they make, make those things into a god, they bow down, and then they pick it up and carry it around. They set it... Uh, in its place, and there it stands. It does not move because it can't, and and it it cannot help anyone. They can pray to it all day long, but they'll never get an answer. In order for an idol to exist, people have to make them out of things that God created. They spend their money on the craftsmen to make one. They donate gold and silver to overlay it. And by the way, I want you to know it's okay to be a craftsman. It's okay to make things. Just don't make God's. Don't make things that go against God. Don't do things that go against God. Sometimes in your professions, you run across things, and there's nothing wrong with your profession, but you can use your profession to do wrong things. You can do, use your profession to make things or say things or do things that go against God. It's okay to be a craftsman as long as you aren't crafting gods for people. You can make other things. You can make chest of drawers. You can make beds. You can make furniture. But just don't try to make a god. Apply that to your life and, and to your profession. They set it up somewhere, maybe in a shrine they made for it. They bow down to it. They worship it. You know, my brothers and sister and I used to pick up on this when we were young, when one of the other children, mostly, started acting all godlike and telling us what to do and things like that. We would bow down to him and say, oh, what a goose you are. You know, and sometimes that was, a, that was an offense to geese. You know, we, we know that my brother, sister, and me, we're not God. And men and women are not God, and you don't bow down to them. There's nothing there. It's just flesh and blood and a, and a spirit that God loves. They're not God. So we don't, we don't bow down in true worship to anything else. Um, once, once you put an idol in its place, it stays there, God says. If, if the shrine happened to catch on fire, then you would have to risk your very life to run and get your God out of the fire before he's destroyed and burned all up. God actually gives us this wonderful story about the powerlessness in 1 Samuel chapter 5 of, of, a, of an idol, a pagan god. And I want to read that. It's really short, but it's a, it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story about how powerful God is and also what, what the value of an actual idol is. Now, this happens to be uh, when Israel decided to use the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, as a lucky rabbit's foot. They were losing a battle. They were going down against the Philistines, and so they said, hey, let's go get the ark and bring it out here, and if we get the ark here, all of a sudden God will show up, and we will win the battle. They brought the ark in there. There was a great war cry that went up from Israel, and the Philistines said, oh, no, what's happening? They've brought God into the camp. And then Israel was defeated by the Philistines, and they took the ark. And the Philistines did what they always did when they defeated somebody else or any other ancient culture. And they took the Ark of the Covenant of God and they put it in front of their God in his shrine, a God named Dagon, and they laid it there as a trophy of Dagon's war, as a trophy of his power, how he defeated Israel's God. And they put the Ark in front of him. And here's the story in 1 Samuel 5. 
Now the Philistines took the ark of God and they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Ashdod is one of the chief Philistine cities and, and, and where the shrine of Dagon their god was. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and they brought it to the house of Dagon and they set it by Dagon. Here's your trophy. We cut the head off of Israel's God. Here's his ark. Now it's your trophy. And they set it there in honor to Dagon. Verse 3. When the Ashdodites arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh. So they took Dagon and they set him in his place again. If Dagon's a god, why didn't he get up by himself in the middle of the night, slap the ark around a little bit and say, don't ever do that again? Instead, the people get up in the morning. There's their god laying on his face in front of the ark. They have to pick him up. Then, verse 4, when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh, and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor all who enter Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Now the hand of Yahweh was heavy on the Ashdodites and he ravaged them and he smote them with, literally the Hebrew word is, is hemorrhoids, and the Ashdodites and its territories. When the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of God of Israel must not remain with us for his hand is severe on us and on Dagon our God. <laughs> we got to protect Dagon. The, the, the Ark of the Covenant and, and Yahweh is too powerful for our God. We're sick and tired of his hands falling off and his head falling off and he's falling on the ground. Let's get rid of the Ark. Let's give it back to Israel and let's put our God back up and let's, let's go ahead and worship him, not put him through all this misery. What kind of a God is that? Not a very good one. You know, here's the real kicker. A person could pour their heart out to it and it would never answer. And you could cry for help in distress, and it would never deliver you. How would you feel if we called a meeting tonight where we would take one hour and compare you to Mr. or Mrs. Potato Head? Would you enjoy that? Would you like all the people at church sitting around talking about how you resemble Mr. Potato Head or how you resemble Mrs. Potato Head? Well, how do you think God in heaven feels when people compare him to a fancy idol and then choose to worship that idol over him. It's ridiculous. So in verses 8 through 11, a look at God's history of action should lead us to affirm that he is the true God. You know, from our heart, we need to make a firm stand of faith that God is real and there is no other. Examining the facts about God and his activities among men and women would put us uh, right into the right conclusion. The proof is there before us remember it and take it to heart. And that's where our prophet says, remember this, be assured, recall it to mind, you sinners. Remember the former things from long ago that God predicts the future and he makes sure that it happens. Verse, verse 10, God, the Alpha and the Omega, has told us the beginning from the end. He has outlined everything that is going to happen in the world and he put it in writing. Dr. Smith said, what he originally planned will appear. What pleases him will stand forever. Whatever God's purposes are, he will see to it that they come about and that no one, not all the people of the earth, not all the angels of the universe, no one banded together in heaven and earth can stop him from doing what he said he's going to do. That's the God that we should serve. In verse 11, he predicts that he will call a warrior from the east. He calls him a bird of prey from a far off country. Now, some people say this is Cyrus. I believe he's talking about Cyrus. But there is no way to definitely say from this text who it is. But this is against Babylon, and when Cyrus took Babylon, he didn't destroy the city. He walked in, and they gave it to him because they didn't want to fight. They had no will to fight anymore. And Cyrus walks in the city. They hand it over to him. And then Cyrus reinstitutes worship of Marduk and, and Nebo. And he, and he makes the people, you know, go, go to worship their own gods. That's the kind of person that he was. He didn't destroy the city. This text doesn't say that he destroyed it, just that God gave it over to his man, that is Cyrus. And we've talked about Cyrus, not even a believer, but God used him. And so what God has planned in the past, he will by, without question, do. And I also think when we get to verse 13, there's an eschatological nature in this, that there's some end times things being spoken about what's going to happen in the land of Israel. So he ends this way in verses 12 and 13. 
The unrighteous should take note that God will bring righteousness and his glory to Zion again. So take action accordingly. Now here's where we get to us. In verse 12, God speaks to those who are stubborn-hearted. Your text may say stubborn-minded. In the Hebrew text, it it literally says stubborn-hearted. That's where you're stubborn, by the way. It's in your heart. We shouldn't be stubborn against God. And those people are not near to his righteousness. They are to listen. And that's why verse 12 says, listen to me. God makes sense. Listen to me. Those of you who who are following other gods, listen to me. And the word listen is used with a view to take action on what you hear because in the Bible, there's no such thing as hearing the word of God unless you do the word of God. So real hearing leads to real doing and taking action on what you know. And here's what God says. Listen carefully. Verse 13. I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off. And my salvation will not delay. I will grant salvation in Zion and my glory for Israel. The Israelites, religious people that have seen God, seen his power, eventually they turn away and they start following other gods. Eventually, they they turn their back on the true God, and all they want to do is, is worship these false gods. And God says, listen to me. Remember who I am. Recall to mind what I've done. Listen to me. I am the God that gives salvation, not these idols. They can do nothing. And so... He says his presence will be a glory for Israel, a place from which salvation will come to those who need it. And this righteousness is not far off, but one that is near. Paul in Romans chapter 10 quotes this in verses 6 through 10. And he says, God is not somewhere way off in the universe that you can't get near him. He's not down in in the earth where you can't get near him and, and, and he won't come up. But he says, God is near you. God is near you. When we apply this text, number one, we would say that there are no other gods but, but our God who exist tripersonally as Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. All other gods are false gods incapable of helping the human condition. Number two, do you understand that Jesus has been and is carrying you? He's carrying you. And, and he will always bear you up and deliver you. Do you believe that he can meet your needs? And it's not going to be something else you can turn to, like like a person or money or whatever else we worship today. Thirdly, the world is not just drifting out of control to self-destruction. God is moving it to, to his desired end that he has planned for it, and he will bring righteousness to the earth and display his glory. Well, why not get on board today with him right now while there's time to do it? There is only one God. What I'm asking you, is he your God Is Jesus your God? Or have you chosen another? This text says that my salvation will not delay. We know that God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he died on a cross. Why did he have to die on a cross? Because you couldn't. He died to pay for your sins, and he died to pay for your sins because you can't. And the reason that he did that is because he loved you, and he wants you to have life with him. You know what, I don't know what you've been taught. I don't know where you've been in your life. But as I read the Bible, it says this. You're a sinner and you're bound for hell as I am. And sinners cannot offer to God enough goodness. We cannot offer him enough money. We can't go to church enough. We can't get baptized enough. Uh, We can't take communion enough. And all the other things we think are good because the Bible says all of our all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. Just go ahead and offer God filthy rags for your salvation when you get to heaven and see what he says to you. But Lord, I, I, I went to church and I did good things and I did all the stuff the church told me to do. And he says, that's not what I asked of you. And now you can't tell him you didn't know that because I'm telling you. And you go ahead and offer your good works to God. And you say, okay, you brought filthy rags. I don't, I don't want them. I throw them out. The, the issue is, what did you do with me, Jesus will say. The issue is, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes, you have to make a decision. It, it doesn't just happen you know, by showing up at church. You have to make a decision. Have you made that decision? Is Jesus really your God? Have you said, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of those sins. And I right now believe 
that your son died on the cross and paid for all of my sins. And the Bible says, in believing that, you have life. See, some of you maybe believe in all kinds of other things, like you're going to work your way into heaven. You are not. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness, but it's by faith and faith alone that you can enter into heaven. It's so simple, and yet it's so profound. It was so simple for us. It's so difficult for God who had to give his son. If you could work your way into heaven, God would not have sent his son to go through what he went through uh, in order that you could have life. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And if you don't go through Jesus, you don't get there. So I'm begging of you to consider it. Have you done that? Are you trusting? Have you said to God, God, forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus and his blood paid for all my sins on the cross. Have you done that? And in believing you have life? That's the message of the gospel. It's been the message all along. God wants people to understand. He is the God who brings salvation. You will find it nowhere else. You won't find it in church with religious people. You won't find it in religious activities. That's not what God wants of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are people all over the world that are messing up the message of the gospel. It is so simple and it is so straightforward, and yet people want to add things to the gospel. Yeah, you have to be sorry for your sins, and then you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to have this good work and and not do these other things, and none of that is true. Salvation is through the blood of Jesus Christ by faith alone. Paul taught that very clearly in the book of Romans. And Lord, if there's somebody here who's not made that decision, I pray that today the Spirit of God would speak to their heart, that you would call on them to repent, that you would tell them in their heart to accept you, to believe in you. Uh, They've been believing in themselves and their own good works. God, I pray that you would touch their heart. If they need help to do this, or they're not sure how to to make that step of faith and repentance, God, help them. May they be comfortable enough with me to say, Pastor, I just need some guidance on that. I need some help with that. I would love to do that. And then to help them grow in their walk with you. Lord, religious people can be just as blind as non-religious people, as was proven by the fact that this text was written to people who should have known better. And Lord, I know we don't bow down to idols here that somebody made, but we do bow down to money. We don't bow down to powerful people or people that we love. We bow down to things in this world who get the love and affection and worship that you are supposed to get, and we're guilty of idolatry some. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us not to say this is just an ancient text that has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with us. So I pray that your spirit would speak to us through it. And I ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.